where are the people and what are they looking for? And that's where I want to be. So right now it's Google, obviously. Google pretty much has a monopoly on search in the United States. So yeah, that would be my advice to everybody. Hey, where are the people who are looking for your products? That's where you want to be. Hello and welcome to the Philly Made Podcast, the podcast where we build community by learning more about our fellow Philly friends in the business world. I'm your host, Shannon, Penji's Partnership Coordinator, and I'm joined here today with a very special guest, Anthony Higman, founder and CEO of AdSquire. In this episode, we discuss some secrets of how to cut costs using Google Ads, how working in the mailroom can really get you places if you're ambitious enough, and the infamous John Morgan ads around Philly. In our chat today, Anthony mentioned the amount of thought he put into his business's brand and how important he believed it was to have something unique for people to remember you by. Well, this podcast is powered by Penji, a creative subscription service that gives you access to pre-vetted agency trained creatives from all over the world that can do all of that work for you. If you're interested in using our services, head over to our website, penji.co, and sign up using the code adsquire15, which is located in the description too. Now on to the show. Hello, Anthony. Thank you so much for coming on with me today. <laughs> Ooh, thanks, man. <laughs> um, so my first question for you is what inspired you to start this business? And uh, was this a market that you noticed and needed advertising assistance since it's very niche? Um, great question. Um, so it's sort of a long story and kind of relates to my whole path. But basically, I graduated in 2008 with a degree in journalism um and at that time all the newspapers were trying to make the shift from um, print to digital and they were all like closing up shop so i applied to like 100 different uh journalism positions and some of them were like hey we really liked you but we're going bankrupt so the job no longer exists um and so to pay the bills i took a position in the mail room of a really big law firm down here in center city um and worked in the mail room for a couple of years but was always kind of looking for different opportunities um always trying to network and like she would also like, law firm had a couple of different positions um that i migrated to and then eventually i ended up on the marketing team um helping with all of their Google advertising and they spent like a lot of money on Google advertising. And so that's kind of how I got into this. Um, and then I had to learn really fast, like everything about Google advertising and ended up saving them like a bunch of money on some like really minor detail stuff. And then realized, um, that there was a lot of other law firms that had the same problems over time. I love the um, the mailroom to now story. I feel like that's for for some reason the starting at the mailroom is a common trope, <laughs> which I love. And don't knock the mailroom. The yeah, types yeah. of places. What a lot. It was, it was actually like really fun too. So it was like you know I just graduated college. Um, it was all like kids my age. So like it was fun <laughs> for the time. Uh, because like we would go out party after work and, like, <laughs> a couple more years of college to be honest with you but then it got like old because i was like i have a college degree and i'm copying papers all day <laughs> yeah <laughs> i understand that we you learn a lot that's all we did yeah, well, again and then like, you're part of a company exactly and then i tried to to again get get to any other position so did this help your process in figuring out what worked for law firms from like a marketing standpoint? Um, it did. Yes. Um, like I said, like I was managing like a lot of money at this law firm, um, very big law firm in center city, like a skyscraper, like there was 150 people that worked there. Um, and so, yeah, like I had to learn fast because I was managing so much money, I was kind of like nervous, like, oh my God, I'm managing all this money. Um, so I really had to learn fast, like about all the ins and outs of Google advertising. And I had a lot of time um, to do that in this position. 
because it was just one account that I was working on all day, right? So I would learn or I would read like all of the Google help documents um, and really like understand the fundamentals. And then in reading everything and like grasping on that knowledge, everything kind of like clicked to me. Um, and I learned just some like some nuanced settings that were like wasting some money. And I was able to kind of like go down rabbit holes and find all this data and all this information that was like a little bit hidden. And yeah, that helped me really to like understand where was money being wasted um, and really like fine tune and, and hone the money that we were using for like the best spots. And over time, I learned that like a lot of people have this problem because of how it, how the advertising program set up. So like, there's just a lot of details in it. And yes, absolutely. That first position was like critical to, to me being here and to me like learning everything about. So what were they wasting? Where were, <laughs> where were they wasting? <laughs> uh, curiosity. Uh, yeah. So Google, like Google's great, but um, you know, they're, uh, obviously trying to make the most money too. So like when you set up a Google ads account, um, it's very guided to walk you through what settings Google wants you to use. Right. Although they're, they may not be the best, like for a specific, uh, niche. Right. So one of the biggest ones is this, is this pre opted into setting called search partners. Um, and it's like on all these different websites it's not just somebody going to google and typing in i need a personal injury lawyer it's like a bunch of other weird websites and that can spend like up to 50 percent of your advertising budget and it works different than google search and a lot of people don't know that or know that you're pre-opted into it and so just that one setting can save you 50 percent of your budget to go towards people who are on Google looking for something. So like that was a really big one that we found and like that I've carried through. Um, again, like there are some types of businesses where it can make sense to be on search partners, especially like the e-commerce side. So it's not like a hundred percent ill intentioned by Google, but with legal, it doesn't really make sense. And so again, like just that one setting, turning that off, um, can like make your budget go a lot farther and can save you a lot of money over time. So that's actually incredible because I, I, did, I, I didn't know anything about that. So that's actually a great tip for our audience. So I appreciate that. Uh, and then, uh, so if you, I know you specialize in Google ads. Um, if you were to pick one place for a law firm to be advertised, is that what you would choose? Like for effective and important? It is. Um, but like what I always say, like my slogan is, um, where are the people and what are they looking for? And that's where I want to be. So right now it's Google, obviously, um, Google pretty much has a monopoly on search in the United States. Uh, I believe the latest is like 86% of the search market is what they kind of own. Um, so yeah, like that would be my advice to everybody is like, Hey, where are the people who are looking for your products? Like that's where you want to be. Obviously like there's more to that picture, like outside branding. Um, and there's other stuff that we do, but if I had to choose one, absolutely Google, it might not always be Google. So like we go where the people are and for what they're looking. Okay. So, um, in your opinion, what does your service do differently or better than other services like yours? Sure. Um, yeah. So like I said, like from my start, um, I had to learn all of this information. Uh, well, I didn't have to, but I, I did. <laughs> um, I read like every help article and um, in each help article in Google, there's like 50 links out. So like you go down these rabbit holes, um, and, and learn all of this information. And it really just like clicked, everything kind of just clicked after I, I got the fundamentals and, and learned everything that was in those help documents. Um, so I think that that's a really big thing is like the knowledge, the fundamental base. And then after that, um, that where I was going here. Um, 
Oh, after that, okay. Yeah, so like the other thing that kind of sets us apart is we spend about 30% of our time outside of the Google Ads platform. And by that, I mean like we're looking at Google search results, search results pages. So we're doing those searches. So I'm like looking up like whatever our clients are advertising for, if it's personal injury or, or criminal law, whatever it is, I'm going to Google and I'm, I'm typing in personal injury lawyer. Hmm. And that helps us see what's changing on Google search results pages. Um, a lot of people can get lost in just staying in the Google Ads platform because there's so much data, there's so many things to look at. But if you're not looking at the search result pages, you're really missing out on like the changes that that Google's making. So like something in the platform might like explode, like your click through rate might go through the roof, and you're like, oh, my ads are doing really great. You don't realize like Google's made a change to how they're displaying ads or they're they add it in another spot or something like that so that is super helpful also that's that's helped us like get a lot of press because we generally will find the new thing first and then like talk about it on social media and then people will pick it up and tell everybody else so that's kind of like helped us and also i do think that's what sets us apart is like being really zoomed into the details looking to see what's changing and then again like the fundamental base of knowledge just from reading the help documents uh you know 12 years ago in my first <laughs> so you um i saw that you, your website says that you advertise on hulu for streaming services specifically is that because um other streaming services don't provide advertising for small businesses or is it just something that you specialize in? Um, great question. We do not sell a lot of Hulu advertising. <laughs> um, so that came out, I think, two years ago, like a self-service platform for small businesses. <laughs> it was one with like a low barrier to, barrier to entry because a lot of the streaming services will have like a, a minimum monthly spend requirement. And it's generally like a $5,000 spend requirement on just kind of like OTT is what we call it, but basically streaming services. Um, Hulu started out with a $500 minimum. So it's kind of like a very low barrier to entry. That's why it's on our website. Um, we're very interested in the OTT space, um, but we mainly do advertising through YouTube and YouTube. That makes sense. I do see a lot of all law ads there. <laughs> it's our like, you know, Google's kind of streaming options. They also just recently um, rolled out Google TV, which is different from YouTube TV. Um, and it's kind of like Pluto or Tubi kind of like, so it's like a, a free streaming TV setup. Um, so we're kind of just dipping our toe into that. So again, like we're very interested in it because of how consumers viewing habits have changed over time like when all the streaming things came out uh it's been this war against like linear tv versus the streaming um options and so like the streaming audience has definitely grown over time i've spent a lot of time like in those um platforms like learning how those ads work so we're, we're like well versed in that but i would say most of our advertisers and most of the streaming stuff that we do is YouTube or YouTube TV. That totally makes sense. I think people are more frequenting YouTube too. Like not everyone has a Hulu subscription, but almost everyone uses YouTube. I feel like even if they're just watching a how-to video. Yeah, totally. That makes sense. So um, how often do you do billboard campaigns? Like, do they work? Oh, you're talking about our, our digital billboard? Yeah. <laughs> so we do them for us oh okay 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 do them for us sometimes we have not sold a lot of digital billboards either um but i think it's something that's gonna grow um you know the the problem is digital versus again um static in in this in this case so all lawyers want the static billboards billboards that stay up and they don't have to share with other advertisers um, I do believe that like, as time goes on, more of those static billboards are gonna turn into digital billboards. Yeah. 
um, and there's going to be less static, right? And so like more people are going to be pushed to the digital side. Um, again, another thing that like we know everything about, we can do really cool stuff with. Um, like we do things sometimes where we'll just like do one billboard. Um, so like anybody, anybody new that we hire, uh, we bring out to the corner and put like on our bus stop billboard on the corner. Um, so like we've learned how to work that platform over time. We also just like went to an SEO conference in New York City and we put us all up on the uh, NASDAQ tower uh, in Times Square. So like that's super cool. So we have a lot of knowledge in that space. Um, we haven't sold a lot of it again, because I think like currently digital versus static would be like half the price, right? So like, let's say it be like about half the price. But again, you're then still sharing it with like three to five to 10 advertisers. Mm -hmm. um, so like at this point, it's not crazy um like it's not a crazy offering because they still want the static but, but like i said i do think it's going to grow over time and um we are like we we do talk to a lot of advertisers about it we always mention it again we haven't really sold a lot of it yet okay how what's your opinion on the john morgan billboard campaign um yeah <laughs> the one that works with law firm. <laughs> yeah. so um it's interesting um i i kind of have like mixed feelings about john morgan because um again like even in the digital space he, he he has like a very large presence and so you know before john morgan came around things were a lot easier because there wasn't this like huge competitor in every single marketplace that we work in um, I also, you know, the, I, I won't get into this in detail, but I think they do some slightly unethical things to the digital side. <laughs> I've heard some things. <laughs> also, um, I will say that he's a good marketer. Um, the, the Built for campaign is insane. And, and like the John Morgan, <laughs> I mean, people talk about it. You're bringing it up. So like, <laughs> that you know it's like what they say any publicity is good publicity um he keeps people talking about him and i think that there's something to be said for that I agree. It, that like they keep doing crazy things that get out there and kind of go viral and and there is something to that so that's kind of my take yeah i think it's it's very funny i actually just read an article about it because i was so curious i i've always been so curious about it because the controversy around it when it came out like appropriating the word and all that stuff so he's i think he's from florida like yeah uh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> so it was someone on his philadelphia marketing team i think that suggested the idea and it like kind of worked really well <laughs> It's not matters one. Yeah, that's hysterical. <laughs> right? I mean, again, like, they're funny. They get people talking. Um, and, and so, like, he's a, a, like I said, a very large advertiser. I think they've, they've said how much they spend a year, and it's, like, in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, there is something, again, to and, and, like, this is kind of piggybacking on the, on the billboard thing. There definitely is something to branding with law firms i mean if you drive down 76 or 95 it's lawyer lawyer billboard uh pharmaceutical and i think now like cannabis right i so, hate singer <laughs> but, but, like, but like the law firm billboards it's like overwhelmingly the majority so mm -hmm. there definitely is something to to branding on on the lawyer side that already has that enormous budget where they can kind of like cover all angles but like that does have a it does play a factor in online too we have some the bigger clients who when you do that outside branding radio billboards tv ott that does filter back into online through brand and search and you can see it so I, I do believe in the outside branding and i again i think it's with John Morgan specifically, he stays relevant. He keeps uh, doing crazy things that keep people talking. And that is a factor in advertising.
for sure. So speaking of branding, how did you come up with your little mascot? I love that. Uh, great question. <laughs> so I had a mentor who was a law firm owner, um, and he believes super heavily in the um, value of branding. He's got a little mascot, uh, and he kind of had always talked to me about um, it was like the RAS, the reticular activating sequence of the brain and how, um, you know, seeing a familiar image triggers something and kind of like makes people already know you. Um, also, when I was starting the business, I spent a lot of time like researching competitors. Um, and what I noticed was like they all had kind of generic logos, like they were all from like the logo generator, free logo generator online. So I wanted to do something different um, that kind of stood out uh, in in that, right? And so um, I drew a little guy and it was slightly different. Like when I drew him, it's the same guy, but he had like um, the scales of justice behind him with like clicks and conversions on the scales. Right. I took that out, um, but then we had a designer um, put it together and there you go. That's how the ad squire little guy was born and then uh what about your um your name oh okay um the name another good story um when i so i'd been i'd been thinking about starting my own business my own digital marketing agency for for years i think like maybe eight years um and i had i had already had the name like picked out it was going to be digital esquire um, and so like two weeks before I filed LLC and started the website, um, another digital marketing agency rebranded to go after legal and they bought digitalesquire.com and called themselves Digital Esquire. And so I was like, <laughs> um, so I had to kind of pivot and, um, just was thinking and I was like, okay, let me just do ad Squire because it's. You know, we do advertising for lawyers. Let's kind of put both of those those uh, words together, and that's how the the name was. Well, that's it's great that it worked out because it, it seems much more catchy, much more yeah. something that someone will remember. <laughs> Be short, short and to the point. Yeah, the longer the word, the less likely I'm going to remember that. Really fun. All right, it fun or it rhymes. <laughs> Wait, I'll be the right choice. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I was looking at your uh, your LinkedIn page, and uh, I noticed that you have a lot of real estate experience along with advertising. Do you think that having experience in both of these fields helped you with your business now? Um, that's another good question. That might be a slightly long answer. <laughs> um, so yes, in that like, um, in uh, yes, I do. In that like, it's finding opportunities and and zooming in on things that may be overlooked and so I'll, I'll give you the backstory there is um this goes back to the mailroom so i was in the mailroom for i think two years and like i said i was like continuously trying to get out network do anything i could to to get out of the mailroom after those first couple of years because i was like oh man i can't copy papers all day anymore <laughs> <laughs> Um, like, it's just like, it was like a boring job. It was a good job, but it was a boring job. Um, and so I would, I would network and I would try all these things. And like, it just really wasn't working out, um, me getting out of the mailroom. And so you have a lot of downtime in a mailroom, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> there's, there's definitely like time you'll deliver the mail. There was 150 people that worked in the, in the building. So like, you know, we had that little cart, we would deliver the mail. Uh, we do like hand deliveries around the city and then when trial was happening or like when a paralegal needed like something copied or scanned we would do that but then sometimes there was like just hour stretches where we're just like kind of sitting waiting um and so like a lot of people in the mailroom would like watch funny youtube videos and i i, I don't know i'm like ambitious so like I, I eventually like i was like i can't watch another stupid youtube video so <laughs> Um, I would, I would just read stuff. I would look at real estate listings and then I was like, all right, I'm just gonna get my real estate license. So like 
in my downtime at the mail room, I would study like the real estate stuff. I got my real estate license. And then after work, so I would work like a nine to five. After work, I would go work the phones at Keller Williams, which is like right down the street, mm -hmm. for like three hours um, to, to try to get in there as like an out of the mail room thing. I was like, all right, I'm gonna do this. It's gonna turn into full time. It did not. <laughs> Well, real estate's interesting because um, you have to like pay for a desk and you have to like, there's all these fees that come into it. And so like, Same. eventually it didn't make sense for me to do it anymore. But um, in that time, I bought my first house. Um, and so because I got interested in real estate and this is also a crazy story and uh, if this goes back to it and I'll be done, um, is that, is that again like i had all this time to to investigate things and in, in downtime of the mailroom and i found this grant um in philadelphia it was like a fifteen thousand dollar grant and it paid for your down payment and your closing costs and so i went to the convention center this one day stood in line i was like the last person to get in and i got the grant for fifteen thousand dollars so my first house um, it was like this beat up uh, row home in graduate hospital and nobody wanted it and it had been on the market for like a year. The reason nobody wanted it is because it had tenants in it, right? So like they didn't want to deal with, with that situation and it was like run down. Um, but I had like a certain mortgage limit and then I got this grant. Um, and so I got that house. And again, like that's like the recognizing opportunities, things that are overlooked. It had been on the market, nobody else wanted it. And I jumped on it. I got it for $5 down actually, because. Um, at, God. It was $100,000 at the time and it's worth $450,000 today. So, so yes, it will be, but also then I haven't done anything else with my real estate license since. Um, <laughs> I mean, I want to flip houses. And so like this first house was, and still is like that idea. I was trying to build up equity so I could take it out and flip other properties. So I've held on to my real estate license so that I can save 3% like buying and selling, but I have not done anything with it. I've just kind of kept it. <laughs> um, so that's the real estate experience. I have my license. I'm like, registered at at my uh brother's friend's real estate company but i don't do anything advertising is kind of my main thing. okay cool so it's just like something that helps you recognize opportunity and like kind of go for it yeah that's a great skill set to have definitely like a good um baseline i think Chat. yes yes Okay, well, here's my favorite part of the podcast. I have rapid fire questions about Philadelphia for you. Awesome. <laughs> All right, let's, it's, it's a test. Let's see how much you know. No, I'm just kidding. It's not. <laughs> All righty. What's the first word you think about when you think of Philadelphia? John. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what celebrity do you think of when you think of philadelphia Ooh, um probably um ooh, i i'm not even gonna know his actual name but charlie day and um danny devita <laughs> what by the way and that's for them when they were you filming them? Yeah. that's incredible i wish that would be my dream. And the waitress was there too, so I get to meet all three. <laughs> That's so cool. All right, well, you're. I really expect a lot of people to say Rocky. So <laughs> yeah. So that was good. That was a unique one. <laughs> uh, favorite cheese stick spot. Mm, um, Pat. Wow. Yep. Why? Um. <laughs> That's a good question. It was near my grandma's house. You know, Pat's and Gita's right next to each other. Uh, we would have just always go to Pat's. Um, I've had all of them. Um, Jim's would probably be second. So it's Pat's, Jim's, then Gino. I like Jim's. Yeah. I, I, I like Pat's too. I, will, I won't go to Gino's. Sorry. Sorry, Gino's. Uh, no, I'm not. You're not. 
All right. Um, so what's one small business in Philadelphia that you frequent the most? Um, I'd have to say Good Dog Bar, actually. I love Good Dog Bar. I love the photos of the dog. Yeah, super awesome. Um, it's right really next. Really good. Yeah, it's right next to our office. Actually, so we do, like we do launch out every day, um, and Good Dogs like w- one of the main places that we go to. I love Good Dog Bar. The rest is, they're so nice there. Their food is really good, and you get to see dogs. Oh, yeah. What what better? Incredible. You can't. <laughs> Um, what is your, oh, we, okay, so well, this might go in, but maybe you can pick something else. Uh, what's your favorite place for a drink or a meal? Okay. Um, I actually like Park. Um, and then, uh, Mission, Mission Taqueria, I think is what it's called. Mm-hmm. Um, both those places. Uh, Park is great for, like, lunch, because you can sit outside and, and look at Rittenhouse, which I love. Um, and then I love a mojito, so that would be that would be mission. Something about a mojito is like super refreshing. I just went to Miami for a family wedding, and my dad. Anytime we would go to a restaurant, do you have good mojitos here? <laughs> the, the bar, the bartender Tate making them. I think they <laughs> like muddle the the mint. Yeah, we're very flavored. That's a, like a, a favorite super thing. If their main focus is it, it's probably streamlined. I'm sure it's not that bad. And... <laughs> you don't have to feel that guilty. <laughs> it's so funny. Okay, I do love Park. That's one of my sister's favorite uh, restaurants in the city. It's okay. like one of the first restaurants I've been to when I'm uh, before I moved to Philadelphia. She yeah. loves Park. I love mean, that place. <laughs> oh, so good there. Okay, and then um, if you could, these are all very positive. What? If you could change something about Philadelphia, what would it be? That's hard. No, I actually have a lot. See, <laughs> okay. Um, this is gonna be like a maybe slightly controversial um, <laughs> thing, but um, over like the past couple years, um, there's been like interest. I mean, obviously, the pandemic really kind of changed the city. But over the past couple of years, there's some really interesting things going on in that, like, all of these street performers are all over the place in Center City. Um, and so, like, right outside of our office at 1500 uh, Walnut Street is, like, their, like, go-to zone. So, so like, <laughs> and bring, like, like, a band with, like, electric guitars and drums. Of- <laughs> but it's like super loud and like nobody will do anything about it because like um you can't tell people to move like Philadelphia like pass a law where like you can't tell homeless people to move anywhere like even if it's like a noise complaint or whatever like they just can't do anything um so I would get rid of the street performers during normal business hours they're like, I'm all for fun. I'm all for <laughs> work. And it's just like all this crazy noise. So like, that's the one thing, which is maybe slightly. I get it. Some peace and quiet is nice. I feel like you sign up with that for the city, but also, you know, it doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, it, it, it is. Sometimes. Like a, yeah, it's like a. <laughs> it's like something going on, but that's always something going on. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Philadelphia for you. I feel like. I love the most bizarre things that I've said to someone like, oh, that's just Philadelphia. Like they, yeah. they've said something to me that it's the most bizarre thing really, you've yeah. ever heard in your life. And I'm like, oh yeah, it's just Philadelphia. <laughs> it's, just... <laughs> it's a great city. There's <laughs> always, you know. Yeah, I, do love it. I do love the city. Like I can walk home, which is super cool. So like, it's cool. It's nice. It's like, oh, oh, speaking of walking home, what's your favorite neighborhood? Ooh, that's a really hard one too. Um, I, I I'm gonna say mine. Um, <laughs> I am. Um, it, it's you know I live in Graduate Hospital. It's super close to the city. I'm a 15 minute walk, but it's also like quiet. Um, more quiet than than all of the other neighborhoods, I think. Um, because like it's it's being built up now. 
So like, I think maybe in 10 years that can change, but right now it's like super quiet and almost like doesn't really even feel like you're in the city when you get there. So I like that. My, my second favorite, which is another weird one would be the waterfront actually. Like, I guess like old city waterfront. Uh-huh. Um, I like like Cherry Street Pier. My mom loves around there. So that would be my second choice. I get that. I get the quiet thing. I, I love the city. I love being able to visit whenever I want, but I moved to Man Young. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah. I can take it's a 15 minute train it's so easy and I to go to the city and I work in the city twice a week I'm hybrid but I to be able for it to be quiet outside it, it, it's it's a privilege I I I I'm from rural New Jersey so I'm used to the quiet where are you from in Jersey I grew up oh really I'm uh I'm from like 15 minutes from Six Flags okay <laughs> yeah where are you from uh, at Haddonfield, it's like way across the Oh, I know exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the, the Philadelphia of Jersey. Yep, there you go. <laughs> so, um, well, that is everything for today. I really appreciate you coming on to talk to me. Um, yeah, thank and you for having me. Thank you. I didn't get any new recommendations from you, but it seems like we have the same taste. <laughs> <laughs> But um, thank you so much. I think I learned a lot personally, and I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk to me today. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much, Anna.